wonderful places. They're communities for people to see organisms that you really can't see anywhere else. And some organisms like sea stars, for example, unless you've been in the ocean or at the shore, you will have never seen organisms from this particular group. Organisms there are spending the majority of their time underwater when the tide is in. So the same factors that um, affect most marine organisms will be influencing these. But these organisms oftentimes experience kind of a special circumstance when the tide goes out where they're exposed to air. Under those circumstances, they're kind of waiting for the tide to come back in. The amount of dryness or desiccation is an important factor for those organisms. In addition, because water buffers heat so much, heat also becomes important, and that's also correlated with desiccation. But on top of that, there's a bunch of other factors that the organisms experience a lot more variability than they would when they're covered up by water. We saw massive mortality throughout the tide pools and intertidal zone um, of organisms that just experienced temperatures that were way too hot, they dried out way too much, and, um, and they couldn't survive. You know, big, giant mussels, given the size, we assume have been there for many decades. They all died, for example. Climate change increases the variability, the extremes, and also the averages. Depends on the particular environmental factor that we're considering for you know what we're talking about. But if we talk about temperature, for example, we know that the average temperatures are going up, but maybe more importantly to intertidal organisms, the maximum temperatures are going up too. And so it's those extreme events, those are the ones that are problematic you know, for the organisms. Now in general, just shifting the average up also is problematic. That can just be kind of prolonged uh, stress due to environmental factors that organisms then experience. So they're less able to deal with other things that might get them sick or stress them out, for example. So it's, it's not that that mean rise in temperature isn't as important, but what we clearly see is these extreme events that happen, they have immediate, observable, and very serious consequences on populations. They get affected through a number of different mechanisms. One is that they have been negatively impacted by sea star wasting disease, which is a disease that is now prevalent along the west coast of the United States. It has really lowered the population size of many sea star species, not just the purple sea star, which is Pisastro gracious. And the numbers really and kind of the effect depend on the particular species, but Pisastro gracious is one that has been heavily impacted. So population declines at lots of places where basically 90% of the population has died as a result of the disease. But we don't know what the causes of the disease what we do see is that it's pulsy in the sense that, you know, initially it came through and there was high mortality and that was patchy at different areas, but kind of regional at some level. So a site here and a site not too far away kind of experienced high mortality all at the same time. But just to give an example, when the disease first hit, we had high mortality in Seattle and around Vancouver, BC, but we didn't have any here at Bellingham until the following year and then we had really high mortality at sites around here. So that's kind of the patchiness, and that was, that was seen all up and down the coast. What we are very sure is that it's transmissible in the water, so it kind of moves around via currents, in addition that it's, it's very likely to be biological. So it's not a, you know, some environmental chemical or toxin or something like that, but it's likely the result of probably a virus. Well, when I started here in early 2000s, you'd go down to Larrabee and there were hundreds to probably thousands of, of sea stars all along the rocks there. 
And now when you go down there, you find them, you know, but they're certainly no longer thousands. Now, in terms of the other impacts, for example, impact muscle populations and barnacle populations, well, that's what these sea stars eat. So as those populations become impacted through, you know, extreme weather events or climate change, that subsequently has a negative impact on, on the population. I'm always optimistic that populations will be able to start to recover, but they'll continue to be under threat from, you know, extreme weather, both, you know, freezing in the winter and real hot days, heat waves in the summer are really problematic to those populations. And in addition, just kind of human impacts um, at our beaches, those continue to, to threaten intertidal communities. Kind of the more traffic we have down there and the more people are down there picking up sea stars and walking over the substrate, for example, all of that you know, takes a toll on those populations. Being knowledgeable, share information, you know, with others about those populations. You know, when you go and visit, being mindful of where you're walking and how you're interacting with the environment. Certainly if you see people ripping stuff off the rocks and things like that or disturbing the system, you might kindly suggest to them that, you know, that's damaging to the to these communities that are sensitive. Yeah, in general, you you know, there's there's volunteer groups that uh um, you know, people can get involved with to um, help work on restoration or protection of, of communities. There's always philanthropy and donation to organizations that uh, are associated with helping marine nearshore communities.